And we're live with another episode of State Smash Podcast. This time we're live with Shane Radliff of uh, the Vanu Podcast and Liberty Under Attack. Um, before we get into that, some housekeeping, normal housekeeping. Uh, there are links in the description. You can use those links to download uh, the Brave browser to browse ad-free, the uh, the crypto tab to start using spare CPU power to get cryptocurrency uh, with Chrome-based browsers. There's also Liberty Mugs, which has sponsored my content. And uh, if you buy one of their mugs, it's guaranteed to piss off at least somebody. So by all means, bring it to Starbucks and uh, make the people around you very uncomfortable. Um, because that's that's what we got to do. We got to make people uncomfortable. And uh, there's also another link at the bottom to uh, find other ways to support the show. I support many cryptocurrencies, and um, you know can probably support whatever other cryptocurrencies you want, um, as long as you let me know. Um, I just set up my first Doge wallet the other day, so I mean, uh, it's 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 all it's all like relatively new to me to be honest. But either way, um, Shane, why don't you tell us a little bit about what made you an anarchist? Yeah, so basically why I'm an anarchist is uh, it's a uh, perspective. Um, but uh, I guess the, the interesting story, and, and I think what you kind of want to get to is how did I get to where I am today? How did I get to, you know, calling myself an anarchist and, you know, adhering to this ideology? Um, so it, it basically started back, and I would say, mid early to mid uh, 2011 and uh i was uh, at home at that time i was not interested in politics at all i was uh you know running around chasing women and really didn't care about you know anything um but i was uh, at home and i found a documentary on netflix called 9 11 loose change have you uh, have you seen that documentary Jer uh, jeremiah yeah yeah uh, it's uh, if if i remember correctly it's the one which starts to call into question the official narrative and and it's the one where which ha which has people like um calling that sort of thing the the quintish quintessential false 911 conspiracy it's it's sort of like the the flat earth of documentary like that's that's the way people insult it but it's 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 a pretty good documentary if i remember correctly you can watch it on amazon video Right. Yeah. But that was that. Yeah, that was my uh, my first introduction to anything. And after watching that, I was a little mind blown, as you can imagine, uh, from never being introduced to, to these ideas or, I guess, uh, counter narratives before. Uh, so it was, it was kind of funny. I, you know, I, I ran into walked into the living room. My dad has always been interested in politics. Uh, so I went in and said, hey, dad, you know, a third tower fell on 9-11. And he just went through kind of some of the details I'd heard in the documentary. And he just kind of, he just kind of eh, you know, I, I don't know. And kind of you just, just kind of shoved it aside. And uh, I was kind of and, and I did, too. I kind of put aside that pursuit. Uh, indefinitely until a few months later and i walked back into the living room i still with, with my parents at that time i was 18 or 19 and uh he's like oh my gosh shane yeah i looked into that 9-11 uh, thing and uh uh yeah you try lateral commission no uh, and uh, all like he just started running running through a list of things council on foreign relations and uh then i re-picked up that pursuit because uh he wanted to uh to start a website and start talking about some of these things so uh, i said yeah i'll help you do it let's let's do it together so i bought the domain libertyunderattack.com and uh I think this is the first time I've ever told this story, but uh, at least in, in, in this depth. But uh, so I purchased the domain libertyunderattack.com and my dad and I, you know, wrote little articles and blog posts on there for, uh, you know, six months or so. And then he kind of, you know, stopped doing it. And I my interest, uh, you know, only continued to grow. So uh, I kind of, uh, you know, took over the, the the domain name and that's where Liberty Under Attack came from. But um, <clears throat> So yeah, around the 2012 election was the first election cycle, first and last election cycle I was ever interested in politics. Uh, so I, I followed it, and it was actually pretty mild compared to the uh, to the 2016 one between uh, Dolan J. Trump and Hillary Clinton. But uh, you know, I I was you know interested in that. I, I voted once; it was the only time I ever voted. And uh, you know, soon after, kind of became uh, disgruntled with politics. It only took about six months of uh, being in in that uh, being in that realm, and I was already sick of it. I uh, found a guy named uh, Bill Cooper. Uh, a little, a uh, little after that, probably 2012 or 2013, and uh, I don't know if you're f familiar with Bill Cooper, but uh, he was a really interesting dude. Uh, he he wrote a book uh, called Be uh, Behold the Pale Horse, and uh, he had a radio show that ran from like the 19 1990 to 2001 when he was uh, murdered by the bludgies, uh, murdered by the cops. But uh, yeah, he was definitely uh, more of a conspiracist. The first series I ever listened to him, listened to his, listened to of his was uh, Mystery Babylon, and you know I I went down the that's kind of Bill Cooper conspiratorial rabbit hole for for some time, and uh, 
you know, I was I was interested in looking for other alternative media, you know, like Bill's show. But uh, in that conspiratorial realm, I really couldn't find anything. So I, I figured, you know, if I want this outlet to exist, I'm going to have to create it. Like, that's just what I have to do. So in February of 2015, I launched uh, Liberty Under Attack Radio. And uh, it did start out as a replacement to Bill's or an attempted replacement, uh, you know, covering, you know, really deep conspiratorial, you know, subjects and rabbit holes. But uh, a few months later, I came across some anarchists. And, uh, you know, we became uh, friends and started chatting a lot. And uh, they rid they rid me of uh, they ridded me of my uh, status spooks and, uh, you know, talked me through all my contradictions, uh, my my mi minimal contradictions. I would say I was pretty close to anarchism anyways. But, um, you know, they talked me through the rest of it. And uh, I'd say around May of 2015, I came out as an anarchist and it's kind of been, uh, you know, history since that point. So that's kind of the uh, the uh, the short condensed version, I suppose. And and just so that we're absolutely clear for whoever's listening, um, the the one of the status spooks wasn't believing that there was cons were conspiracies, right? Like, <laughs> like you, you still believe oh, yeah. in, in 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 like the trilateral commission controlling a lot of foreign policy, for instance. Sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. yeah the, the, yeah, I guess the, the the only the only real major hangup for me was, was honestly. As I look back, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the fascist books here, memories thing that they do. Um, I'll look at statuses from I posted back in 2014 and, you know, like 2014 before I even really knew of anarchism. And I, like, I sound like an anarchist sometimes, but then I sounded like a controlled schizophrenic at other times. Um, right. the, the real major contention was basically that I didn't trust very many people. And, uh, you know, I don't so I, 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 I don't trust them. So I don't really trust them without a government either. Um, that was kind of the major hang up. And it, that was a really easy one to work through, actually. Um, but it was kind of just trying to, you know, educate myself before I, you know, stepped out uh, into the public as an anarchist. So that's why I took a, a few months of conversation with folks. But that was my, really my only major contention. So, yeah. So and, and OK, so my question is, did becoming an anarchist broaden your idea of how liberty was under attack or did it just change your focus? <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, I would say. I would say it expanded it um, because obviously when I was a minarchist, uh, you know, there's still that kind of uh, the, the, the I was a constitutionalist, actually, uh, that's what Bill was. And he, he did a lot of he talked about the Constitution a lot. And I really dug it back in the day. But um, I would say it expanded it uh, because I, you know, I, I kind of had that mindset that anything in the Constitution is OK, which obviously that's not true as an anarchist. I know that now, but um, I I. I kind of still held on to that, um, that some some aspects of government were good and necessary. But um, yeah, when I became an anarchist, it expanded, you know, every aspect, every aspect of the state, um, even if it's not outright immoral, could be better, could be, you know, the service could be better, better provided by the market. Um, and, you know, from a philosophical perspective, it doesn't have to be funded by force. So <clears throat> I would say it, it definitely expanded it. Yeah, because I mean, if 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 somebody wants to go down a, a conspiracy rabbit hole the idea that that this is all human farming is far more interesting than the idea that as long as we obey a piece of paper uh, everything is going to be fine i would say yeah yeah i i, I agree i agree i mean it, and this is coming from somebody who still has like fucking probably at least a uh, uh, 90 pocket constitutions from trying to start a young Americans for Liberty chapter. So, I mean, I, 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 I was where you are. Um, sorry, not where you are, where you were, uh, before like the Ron Paul campaign. And then the Ron Paul campaign just sort of switched me over because I saw him get the shaft. I saw what politics was and I saw that it couldn't be anything else then a scam and i'm i'm assuming it was something similar because you, like you talk about being disenfranchised by the political system so i mean what was the catalyzing moment that made you realize hey this might be a scam yeah um well it actually wasn't really ron paul i mean i came across some of his videos on on uh, youtube uh, and i watched it and, you know they were they were they were you know good you know i liked them but he really didn't have that much of an impact on me i wouldn't say um right. i I, th I think what 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 really was the catalyst was hearing bill cooper back in the 1990s um, you know, destroy the, uh, you know, the, the war narratives and destroy, uh, you know, the left right paradigm and to, to show that, um, you know, the, I guess the, for, yeah, for me back at that time, it was that, uh, you know, 
politics is rigged. If anyone's going to get into to a position where they can become president, um, you know, presidents are selected, not elected, right? right. Um, so it was basically just the 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 realization that uh, holy shit, I have no control over this whatsoever. Like this is this is just completely out of my control. It's a shit show. Uh, part of my language, but uh, I mean, it, it was just whatever uh, language you want. <laughs> okay, good deal. But uh, that was basically it. I I I felt powerless over it. Uh, you know, power powerless to you know. Um, I guess promote freedom through the through the political means, and um, I mean, yeah, I, I voted that one time in that election, and I you know put together a war on drugs informational protest uh, in, uh on my college campus. But um, I mean, at, that was I, I just realized that those 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 the, you know that route political crusading just wasn't going to uh, you know get me the freedom that I wanted it to. Um, so I, I I I continued to educate myself for. Oh gosh, you know, another four years. Um, the last three being kind of uh, on anarchism and direct action solutions and finding freedom now. Um, but yeah, it was basically just the fact that you know I want freedom and I wanted freedom, and uh, I always you know tried to choose the most efficacious path towards it, and uh, very very quickly realized that politics. Uh, was not the most efficacious route towards personal freedom. It's actually counterintuitive a lot of times uh, in the current political, I guess, uh, system we have now is uh, a result of successful and failed political reforms of the past. So um, it's uh, it's to, to me, it's it's not only a waste of time and you know just a bad strategy for personal freedom. It's uh, actually counterintuitive. So right, right. You know, I, I always phrase it like this to people: Would you buy? Would 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 you would you spend money? on a car that was proven um time and time again and tested time and time again to only work if you were a certain type of person if you were a certain class of person um that you aren't and 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 would you you know still buy this car knowing that there was a very strong likelihood it wouldn't turn on for you um and that you wouldn't be able to get anywhere with it if it did um and and most people most people say yeah no i wouldn't um and they see sort of where i'm going with that because life and time and energy are limited and spending it on politics spending it on trying to uh trying to go through the system i guess would be a decent way of putting it uh to try and achieve change of the system that's built so that it can further itself and not really liberty at all um doesn't strike me as a very good use of one's limited life because like we're gonna die someday and i don't think mm -hmm. anybody wants to look back on their life and think i've i'm i messed up i spent my time doing something that was directly not only useless but like pushed other people in the same useless direction so i would say politics is is not only a scam but it's designed to be make work so i uh, you know it's 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 some pretty bad stuff but you you do um the vanu podcast which if i understand correctly is designed to talk about like you know personal freedom sustainability homesteading that sort of thing uh, could, why don't you describe that a little bit sure sure so uh yeah those are those are definitely elements of vanu but uh um also we'll start with definitions first that's the, the best place to start especially with new concepts like vanu might be to to a lot of your listeners so vanu is an, an awkward contraction of the words voluntary not vulnerable it's premised around becoming as invulnerable to coercion as humanly possible from both public coercers governments and private coercers uh you know just private violators of person and property so even in Kapistan or this hypothetical free society vani would still be relevant because there would still be violators of person and property um so that's kind of the the, the foundation for it um a little a little history here because uh that's kind of some fascinating stuff but uh there's this gentleman back in the 1960s but his real name was tom marshall and he uh, decided to go uh, by a pseudonym later on uh rayo um, he wrote for uh, a number of publications back in the 1960s discussing uh, these ideas and, uh, you know, becoming involved in a, in a number of projects. But um, <clears throat> he uh, was uh, he wanted freedom. Uh, he desired freedom. And uh, he was sick of the all talk, no action libertarians back uh, in his day. Uh, he grew up or he, he lived uh, in the 60s in uh, Southern California where there was a bustling libertarian community. So he was around a lot of libertarians and, and anarchists at that time. But uh, he was just sick of the uh, the talk. He said, "Okay, we, we've got we've got the philosophy down enough. Can we, you know, go live free now?" Uh, and uh, apparently, um, you know, he was kind of uh, you know one of the few that that wanted to go live free now. 
Um, so he moved out of his uh, apartment into, into a camper, mounted on his pickup truck, and he pursued a, a lifestyle change called uh, van nomadism. So uh, he stayed uh, a lot of uh, a lot of his time in the Siskiyou National Forest, which is northern California and southern Oregon. And uh, you know he just traveled around in his van with his free mate Roberta, um, and uh, they you know just uh, lived free. But uh, Rayo wasn't satisfied. Uh, Obviously, if you're driving a vehicle, um, it's uh, wise to have, uh, you know, driver's license and registration, you know, the mandatory insurance, because uh, if you don't have those, that makes you more vulnerable to coercion, right? So if you don't have to have those things, a lot of times they'll take you straight to jail, uh, you know, don't collect, two, don't collect $100 or whatever and, and, and all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> so uh, he didn't like the, the strategy's reliance on slave tags, as he called them. So he decided that uh, him and uh, his freemate decided that they were going to do they were going to go a little further with it. And they decided to pursue wilderness fauna out in the Siskiyou National Forest. So they used the vein a little bit. But uh, generally, you know, throughout, uh, you know, probably nine, ten months of the year, they lived in a polyethylene A tent in the middle of a national forest. Um, and to, uh, I guess, provide a, a visual for your listeners here, polyethylene A tent. Just imagine you have two trees. Uh, you know, across from each other, you have a you have a rope, a ridge rope connecting the two, and you throw a piece of plastic over the top, and that's what they lived in uh, for a, a large portion of the time. Um, so Ray was a pretty hardcore guy, and uh, the last we heard from him was 1974 when he ceased all communications. Uh, so we don't know what happened of him uh, after that, but um, he uh, the the last the last we really know is that he was uh, starting to experiment with uh, underground dwellings. Uh, he was pursuing troglodytism. So um, that was Rayo and uh, the guy that largely developed this freedom strategy. But it's in no way I always I always kind of provide this uh, caveat. And when I give presentations on Bonnie, I uh, always like to see the I always like to provide that history and then just like look for the reactions. Because if you yeah, talk because... about, you know, wilderness Bonnie, they're like, OK, so this is one of those things. No, I just it just that's what Rayo did. There's a lot of a lot, a lot of other more practical things that we can do in pursuance of freedom. But well, right. And, it, you know, because you, you say troglodytism and most people are only going to assume that you mean the insulting term of troglodyte so i mean on that level it's sort of like saying you're an anarchist people are going to take a second look because they're gonna wonder what you're what you're really advocating and sometimes it's as simple as saying i'm just really advocating this other thing so what would you what would your version of vanu be Sure, sure. So, so there are a lot of uh, options for for Vanu, and uh, some strategies, I mean, haven't been, or some you know lifestyle changes have not been conceived of yet. We haven't thought of all of them. Some of them haven't been fleshed out completely, like Vanuing in cities. Um, but, uh, but yeah, some of the some of the strategies, uh, the the one that I'm going to pr be pursuing is van nomadism, um, and this is super practical. Um, well, super practical as far as um, you know, for as a strategy for personal freedom, it's uh, not only one of the most liberating strategies, but it's also one of the cheapest. Uh, most of the uh, van nomads, uh, as ca I've, I looked into probably a hundred case studies. Uh, if you type in van dwelling on YouTube, there's a bunch of these folks. It's awesome. Um, but uh, most of these folks live on five hundred to seven hundred fifty dollars a month, and uh, they live uh, they live pretty well out there on the road because uh, the largest expense for most folks is um, camping is fees, housing. Right? Well, is for for your average person, their the most their most expensive expense uh, is is housing. So once you yeah. move out of your stationary dwelling, you don't have to pay that mortgage. You don't have to pay that. Uh, uh, you don't have that two hundred fifty thousand dollars house with with that uh, expensive insurance. Um, once you get rid of that expense, uh, a lot of folks really don't need much to live on, which is uh, what most van nomads find out as they as they uh, get on the road. But as far as the major expenses for van nomads, I mean, it just depends upon what's what's uh, avenue people want to go down. Some stealth camp in cities. Um, where you know they they have a van that looks like a work van. It's a it's a stealth it's a stealth van, and uh, they can pretty much uh, no one knows they're in there sleeping. No one knows they live in there, and they can just they have good spots they park in uh, in various cities. Uh, there are also folks who uh, you know put solar panels on the roof. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to spend a lot of my time off grid, um, not having to pay camping fees. Um, and uh, I guess there's kind of a, a blend, uh, you know, I guess a, a blend in there, too, where some some folks will go to, you know, RV campgrounds. Some will go, uh, you know, so they'll spend some time there, some time uh, out in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the wilderness or whatever. But uh, uh, the most expensive uh, expense for van nomads, I would say, is and it's, it's kind of dependent, though. Um, some for some for some, it would be gas. But for some van nomads don't travel that much, so it wouldn't be gas. Um, probably car insurance, I would say, would be the most expensive uh you know the the biggest expense that uh, the most fan nomads would face, um, but yeah, that's uh, so yeah, that's that's one thing. You got anything there so far? Well, and in and in registration for the vehicle in some states, that's pretty expensive, especially depending on what vehicle you have, um, and and of course, if you plan to 
take that uh, that that vehicle many places wear and tear and uh, and and gas uh, could be a problem well, yeah, um, yeah repairs and breakdowns yeah those yeah when those do happen they can be expensive yeah especially if you if you have to go into the city by foot because essentially you're you're out in the middle of the wilderness and you you can't like get your 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 van repairs done like would you recommend if somebody does this sort of van dwelling kind of thing that they that they have their own personal um like repair kits in their in their van or would you recommend that they just have like AAA or something um, well, trip triple A is just a standard thing. Um, I mean, it's, <clears throat> I think it's like a hundred, 120 bucks a year or something like that. It's hundred, hundred less than 200 bucks a year. And, uh, that's a recommendation from all the, all the van nomads I've seen. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you obviously, since that's going to be your home and you've got to keep all your stuff in there, you can't take your entire, you can't take a massive toolbox with all of your tools. Um, I would say, yeah, definitely bring some tools on board. If you know of common issues with the van that you're, uh, that you drive, like if, uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, some part needs replaced often, if it goes, if it, you know, if it needs replaced often, you might bring a couple of those with you and you know, the tools to repair that. Um, but, um, I mean, there, there are some times that, uh, you know, you might just, uh, I'd say most of the time from, th from the videos I've watched and from uh, van nomads I've talked to, um, most of the repairs, uh, you can be really self-sufficient, but if a part go, if you know, uh, a part breaks and you don't have the parts, even if you know how to fix it, uh, that really doesn't make much of a difference. Right. So, so yeah, I'd say triple a, and then, um, one of the best things about, uh, you know, breaking down in your, uh, live aboard van versus, uh, you know, breaking down in a car is that you've got your house with you. And if you've got solar panels, you've got, you know, a week of food, uh, a week of water. I mean, you don't have to panic. Um, and if triple a is going to take, you know, I don't know, I don't know how long they typically take, but if you're pretty far out there um and it might take them you know uh, a day to get there you're going to be okay uh you've got everything you need on your in, in your van already um especially so that, if you're not vegan and you can hunt yes yes but i mean <laughs> i guess just as a little side note here um a lot of the folks in the van nomad community are do come from kind of the the uh the the leftist persuasion uh <laughs> um well i definitely. have no problem with but, that uh, well no but they, they come from like kind of a leftist persuasion and there are most of the ones i've seen are vegan um which is just kind of funny i don't care about that um at all because these folks are out there you know pursuing their own personal freedom for whatever right. their motivations are so but uh so, so in that perspective okay so what would you personally recommend as the ideal sort of kit for uh, for wilderness living I, I noticed that the background on your page um is like a forest and mountains so what would you say is your ideal kit like maybe your top 10 pieces of kit yeah well that that's um for Vanu, that's a difficult question to answer because it's 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 fully based uh, individually. Some people will you know take more out there. Some might just have a backpack and you know a couple couple things out there, and they'll be fine. You know, pursuing the wilderness Vanu lifestyle. There's also the aspect. Um, uh, Rayo talked about Smoomin. It was an article on Vanu Vanu uh, Vanu life. Uh, Smoomins with super hobos, and he talked about having um, you know various uh, you know various shelters hidden throughout uh, you know like the Siski region for, uh, per se. Uh, and each of those serves different purposes. So you'd have your, like your summer survival, you'd have your winter survival, you'd have, um, <clears throat> a small workshop if you need to do any fabrication or anything like that. And you'd have these various, um, these, these various, um, uh, I guess dwellings or structures that serve different purposes. Um, so as far as, uh, you know, kind of Rayo's, I guess, uh, perspective on the strategy and also what I would say to be the, 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 the pursuit of wilderness fauna that would yield the most uh, invulnerability to coercion uh i would say that it, it would be that that kind of setup with wilderness fauna where um you have your summer survival whether your winter survival you've got your uh you know your small workshop um you've got um you know and, and various and the things that you need at each of those locations and then you'd have stuff that you'd carry to all of your locations like uh um obviously uh, uh storable foods is what rayo mostly lived off of um, they'd have, uh, you know, well, they'd have, uh, you know, gallon drums they could, you know, carry around with them if they needed to. And they had the van for transport as well if they needed it. Um, but, uh, you know, food, water, um, <clears throat> uh, medicine is, uh, crucially important, uh, crucially important, especially if you're a Vanuan, uh, Vanuans don't, uh, typically have, you know, the nine to five health care. So they've got to be kind of right. uh, creative, uh, in their, uh, pursuit of medical treatment. Uh, and, and keeping themselves, uh, you know, from getting, uh, from, from needing any medical attention. Um, I mean, uh, you know, obviously knives and, uh, you know, guns might not be a bad idea if you're going to be doing hunting. Um, and also just for, uh, for, for self-defense, you never know what you're going to come across out there in the Siskiyou. Maybe you'll come across a bear. You might, you never know. 
Um, so you wouldn't pers there personally are... recommend like bows and arrows or something. I mean, maybe, um, you know, uh, and a lot of, a lot of bows and arrows are lightweight, which, you know, uh, so they wouldn't be hard to haul around. Um, I, I guess it, it would just be up to the individual for me. I don't have any experience with bows and arrows, so I wouldn't, uh, I, wouldn't gotcha. personally, I wouldn't personally bring, I wouldn't personally bring one, but if someone's, you know, a master archer and, uh, they, you know, want to, uh, and they, it would make them stealthier too, right? It's a, and a bow is a lot quieter than a gun. So if they hunt, uh, you know, deer with their bow, then, um, they would be a, a little ahead of me with my, my firearms. Um, <laughs> you know, since uh, they do make loud noises and such and, and draw some attention. So, yeah. Yeah. Cause like I've talked to many people who are into survivalism and about a third of them advocate bows and arrows and about like, I would say, um, a quarter of the rest advocate just knife hunting, like, and taking the stealth approach. Like I, I know this, I'm not going to mention his name, but I know this really cool um, native American dude. Um, and he just, he, he, he showed me how quiet you can be wearing moccasins. And like, he, he showed like, essentially, if you use this weird S pattern with your walk, uh, moving forward, it, well, okay, more of a zigzag. I don't know. He didn't describe it as either, but it's, 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 it's this weird thing where you overstep over your legs. Um, you can sort of like advance in the same in, in a in a singular direction without leaving tracks and without making sounds like you can avoid snapping twigs even and it's all about like body weight distribution and i was really impressed by that because he said he said essentially that if you're very careful you can sneak up on large game uh, if they're like eating or something with that that's interesting. That's interesting. And Rayo did talk about um, uh, you like uh, if you're around where one of your Banu shelters is, where you know I think there's like soft soled shoes, like you're talking about moccasins. Um, like you, when you're around your 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 Banu home, yeah, wear you know moccasins, not uh, work boots that'll leave uh, tracks. Now, if you're far away from your uh, you know your Banu shelter, um, then you know maybe you could wear some uh, some uh, some hard soled boots. Um, I don't know if that's the right term, but I think you know what I mean. Um, then, then yeah, you you could do that out there. So he he Rayo even you know talked about uh, kind of uh, utilizing those sorts of strategies, uh, you know, for uh, for for concealment purposes. Um, so yeah, I mean, w wilderness fauna is an interesting one. Um, it's not the most uh, attractive to folks. Fan nomadism is uh, extremely attractive to folks, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, I'd really recommend your listeners go to just type in van dwelling on YouTube to really really. I don't know. It, it, all, all it takes, um, and, and I think this is this is pretty typical for a lot of van nomads, is they they find uh, these YouTube videos and uh, they binge watch them for an extended period of time, like I did for you know two months straight, basically every night watching two or three hours of this stuff, uh, really learning about the lifestyle or all the obstacles. Um, some of the obstacles, uh, you know, the, the, the major benefits and all of that. Um, that's what drew me. Like uh, Ray, I've known about van nomadism for like three years. Um, you know, Rayo talked about it in his book that I digitized three years ago that uh, your listeners can can find for free at uh, bonniepodcast.com. But um, I just I, I really didn't. Uh, it, it, it took uh, seeing seeing the uh, the lifestyle in action. And uh, I don't know. I don't know about you, man, but uh, I don't do well uh, in servile society nine to five jobs. Um, I just. Don't oh, do yeah. Well. well so that's 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 one of the perks of having said what i've said is that you don't really get hired for those sorts of d jobs even if you apply so i have I, I i do a bunch of odd jobs and like you know i i'm i do graphic design and that sort of thing and and that usually keeps me somewhat above water but um but like when i did have a nine to five job it was I, I, I don't know where you are in the country or if they have these where the you Cato, are Illinois. but Okay, well, do they have Jack in the Boxes there? No. Okay, well, it's terrible, the one I worked at, and uh, nobody should ever choose that as a job if they have any other choice, um, I would say. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> basically, what what you are is... The, the, it's, it's, it's really ironic. I started to feel like it. Um, you, like, the clown mascot. is It's a little clown. It's a Jack in the Box... Um, with a little pointy hat and it and it's basically like it makes you feel like the only thing you're doing is being pushed at people's demand like they turn the crank and out comes food you're not really a human and so i, I yeah i would say that the more freedom-minded you are the less that sort of job seems appealing um definitely 
Yeah, yeah, and that's why I, I mean, I, I need a lifestyle that's um, I mean, and and I, I've got type one diabetes too, so I don't know how long I I I I, I could live it to be like seventy five or eighty, but I could also have complications and die at age fifty. So so I I I as you as you said earlier, I mean, I've got one life to live, and uh, I don't want to spend my entire life working, you know, forty hours a week at a job I don't like, right? So van nomadism is an option. It's a it's a real option. You you don't need as much to live on, and um uh you know with the with the advent of the internet, um. You know, there's a there's a lot of uh, opportunities for freelancing and you uh, and you know digital nomadism, which is a thing. It's a really popular thing. Um, there are a lot of opportunities out there where you can uh, you don't it, since you don't need to live on as much, you don't need to work as much, and therefore you a lot more of your time is your time. Uh, so I for, for van nomadism for me is just. Um, I would say it's an interim lifestyle change. Um, that's how Rayo utilized it too. It's for for someone who is uh, heavily involved in the state of survival society. Um, it's a really good way to get people out of that. You know, I guess I, I guess get them with if they if they need to get out of the survival society, it's a good interim lifestyle. Um, and it's also you know some people do it forever. Um, but for me, I, I'm probably I'm probably going to use that as an interim lifestyle because I'd still want to pursue minimal sailboating and live out on the ocean. Um, that's right. the end goal, but I don't have the capital for that now. I don't have the experience. I've never sailed a boat, and uh, I don't know how to navigate the high seas. So um, well, that yeah. one's a little more difficult than just tr doing what I've done for ten years, traveling around in my car. So right, yeah. Well, and 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 on that level, um, I guess like I was gonna bring this up after, but I guess it's a good uh, sort of segue into it now. Uh, you've heard of Steam it, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, are are you on that yet? Yes, yeah, steamit.com forward slash at Shane Rattle. If I joined in uh, like mid 2016, yeah. Right. So on that level, there's 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 plenty of people over there uh, who use that as a micro economy. And I think that the cryptocurrency economy is something that's that's going to be huge relatively shortly because the dollar is an untenable mess and it requires um, like a very unstable system that is doomed to fail because of the, right. the very nature of the currency. It's it's a debt scam. And so essentially I, I advocate people get in on cryptocurrency and there's like there's this thing called Steam gigs and it's relatively new. But what it is is it's freelance work and people can get paid in Steam. And I'm not sponsored by them or anything, Ooh, but I need uh, to and I have that. Yeah, yeah. Steam, and, and, Steam I, and I have dot com, yeah. And I haven't been paid by them, and I'm, I haven't like st like started a Steam gig yet. I'm going to though. It's going to be a recurring gig for graphic design and whatever else people need. But essentially, um, like w what what that does, what that sort of digital micro economy does, is it frees people up to like stop being like essentially uh, a servant to the system that uh, that that is des designed them to be a tax cattle and while i don't think a lot of people are going to do that while i think that that sort of thing is going to be very rare um especially if the elites finally decide to act on the georgia guidestones which i would love to get <laughs> your opinion on that sort of thing yeah. um before this podcast is over since your your start was in conspiracies much like mine um but you know that doesn't mean that people can't start now and it doesn't mean that they can't start getting involved with the cryptocurrency micro economies because there's pretty much one for everybody there are cryptocurrencies for a people of leftist persuasion to use that are designed to support uh, a universal basic income or a profit free mutualist existence or something like that um, you know, and, and there are ones for like more right leaning people or more technology leaning people. Um, you know, there's a hemp coin and a pot coin that are constantly competing for, for, for traction, you know, there, there, and, and I, I guess I, my main point is I want to get your idea on how to still stay at least somewhat connected, uh, if you are of, into Vanu or if that's even considered preferable, um, to, to stay connected to the outside world or if it's just designed to shut you off completely from it. Yeah, um, so so it, it could do it could do whatever. I mean, whatever the individual wants to do in their pursuit of Vanu, they can do. Rayo, um, as your listeners can can probably clearly tell, he was more of an I, I isolationist, I guess you could say, not in the anti not in the war sense either. He was just uh, he lived in isolation. He wasn't a big fan of uh, 
uh, he, he wasn't a big fan of people. So wilderness fawning with him and his free mate work very, very well for him. But there are um, other strategies, uh, you know, like intentional communities. Um, <clears throat> there are van nomad caravans, which would be a van nomad intentional community. Um, so there's mobile and mobile and I guess fixed uh, intentional communities where people can associate with others to pursue whatever goals they uh, want to pursue. If that's self-sufficiency, great. If it's, uh, um, I don't know, a private digital economy using a, a cryptocurrency uh, and mesh network nodes. Great. I mean, wh whatever, whatever the end goal for them is, uh, whatever the end goal for, for them is, is it, it, it's, it's great. Um, pe you can definitely work with others in pursuit of Vanu. Um, as long as you're trying to minimize the c connection to the system that would enslave you, I guess would be a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, cause the idea is to start Vani mini cultures where, you know, autonomy, freedom and where autonomy and, and freedom are respected and where, where, you know, there's peace and not, uh, you know, war and people getting beaten by bludgies and all of those things. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. Um, now you asked, uh, like, uh, in regards to staying connected to um, the servile society or staying connected to um, <clears throat> the the internet. Um, some some will choose to disconnect completely and not really utilize any of that technology. Kind of go more of the primitive primitive primitivist primitivist route, uh, if I can speak. Um, but uh, there are a lot of digital nomads out there that uh, you know stay connected to the internet out uh, you know off grid. Uh, you know the uh, internet yeah, accessibility has increased so much. Um, now it's, it may be, it may be a little more expensive than what you pay at your stationary dwelling, but there's also free Wi-Fi and such too. I mean, you, 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 you you're, <clears throat> there's going to be some utilization of, uh, of the state of survival society's infrastructure early on. Right. Um, because until there's an alternative economy, uh, developed, um, there's going to be some reliance upon it. That's just kind of a given. Um, so, I mean, as, as far as what, what I'm going to do, there's going to be some interaction with the first, with, uh, the survival society. Um, definitely I'm going to stay connected to the internet because I'm going to continue doing podcasting and, and creating self-liberational media. Um, but, um, yeah, I guess that's, uh, as far as staying connected, uh, some people will choose not to, I'll, I'll choose to stay connected, but I'll also choose to, uh, you know, uh, stay out, uh, off grid for weeks at a time. So I don't have to have interaction with people who would rather have me, uh, would rather see me toss in a cage. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Well, it, it, cause the general reason I ask that is because in order for actual change to happen, people have to see a possible favorable outcome, a possible favorable lifestyle, and they have to be able to see it work. Like, sure. I mean, because that's the reason most people are sticking with the society that we have, because they they have a long standing precedent of these sorts of status societies. I hate to use this word in relation to them, but working. And, uh, and so I think that a decent amount of these people, if this was to become a thing, uh, would have to essentially keep connected enough that they could tell their su success stories to people. And that yeah. would mean that, it, that like they would have to be less introverted than a lot of these people seem to be um, and possibly like more social than a lot of these people seem to be. And I think that sure. if, uh, if, if that sort of thing started to look like something your na your next door neighbor could get into and s started to look like something that you could raise your children positively in i think that that would help dramatically so um i mean do you, which do you think has more value the insular sort of i'm i'm gonna you know inch my way out of society um or do you uh, do, like, do you think that there's any value to sort of keeping connected so that you can send letters from the, you know, positive future um, to get people on board? Right, right. And that's and that's self liberational media. That's, uh, you know, the van dwelling portion of YouTube. Um, that's exactly what that is. Showing people the lifestyle, getting them interested, showing them that it's practical and affordable. And uh, then people decide to then some people pr decide to pursue the lifestyle. Um, so I think uh, I, I think that's uh, a really, really, you know, I, I think that's a really important thing if we're going to see um, more people you know, joining, uh, I guess, uh, making these lifestyle changes and pursuance of freedom. Uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of a, uh, uh, a requirement. Um, now there, there's a website called anaplex.org and, and it's, there's uh, there was one post on there that said, and I'm going to badly paraphrase it probably, but, um, you are, ex you're exactly correct that <clears throat> for a lot of people, they see no way out of the system. Um, they, they see no way out of it whatsoever. So what, what's what freedom pioneers are doing now 
is they're you know learning the lifestyle they're uh, you know uh, developing it they're trying to make it easier and more simple for people that uh, for for new people to you know adopt this lifestyle change. Um, now back to the anaplex.org thing. Um, the the idea here is that Freedom Pioneer, or I guess the <clears throat> the idea is to make um, the make it a, a seamless transition from the servile society to one of these free lifestyles. So, uh, for example, the, the the main task of Freedom Pioneers, and this is this was a really really terrific point by uh, the the anonymous authors at anaplex.org. But um, that once once uh, once uh, an individual can pay like twenty nine ninety nine a month for all of the essential services to withdraw from the servile society, um, once it's that easy to do, um, then I think we'll finally see some you know some really drastic change happen quickly because there there are a lot of folks out there, man, that they they do see problems with with things the way they are. Um, they've been presented with a very narrow list of solutions, mostly by the the state and their government controlled the uh, uh, and the government controlled media. Um, so I think once um, I, I don't think it's going to be you know critical mass or anything like that, but I do think it will it will grow um, it'll it'll grow quite a bit um, once these lifestyle changes are easy and seamless to transition into because like like I said there's for other folks that see problems they just see no way out um, so that's I think that's my main task with uh, with the Vani podcast and with Liberty Under Attack is to show people that these solutions exist and to interview people who are actually doing these things uh, and to, I guess, just uh, give give my listeners all of the information necessary to start making decisions uh, on what strategies they're going to pursue. So I agree 100% with what you were with what you're saying. And I think, um, you know, uh, staying staying connected and really promoting the the drastic freedom increases that these strategies bring forth, I think is uh, is a really great thing to do. But I guess just as as kind of the the counter position here, not really counter position, but um, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure um, yeah, I, supplementary, complimentary, wh whatever you want to call it. Um, <clears throat> but obvious, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, an empty cup can't fill another. So right. I, I do think it's important for, especially probably at the beginning when, when the transition is, when the transition is, you know, starting when, when they, when they sell their house, move out of their apartment and they move into their van and start traveling around. I think there should be some time, like a transition time where they, you know, really where they have to get used to the lifestyle and, uh, you know, get used to get to get used to it mentally, because after working for 40 hours for however long, however many years the individual in question has, you know, done that when it, once they don't have to do that. Um, they're gonna have a lot of time to the time to themselves, right? Um, so I, it, it's it's the there there are gonna be some mental hurdles um, to this lifestyle that I, I think even uh, you know the uh, as I said the twenty nine ninety nine essential services to withdraw from the, the servile society. Um, I think the mental the mental struggles are gonna be there for anybody. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, being in uncomfortable position, uh, uncomfortable positions is where people really grow. Right. Um, so I, I think there should there, there might be a, a transit. There might be a transition time where maybe they are really introverted while they're trying to learn how to live this new life. But I think uh, as soon as they get some things figured out, they need to share those with the world so that um, people don't have to go through the same mistakes that they did. Right. And because because I think that uh, uh, the problem with a lot of really good workable anarchist thought is a lot of people who I, I don't want to be too insulting, but a lot of people who who get involved in anarchy get involved in anarchy because society is way too demanding of somebody who's that introverted um, to, to be social, to be involved, to, you know, share with the other kids, to, you know, be a contributing member to essentially this capitalist class, um, and, and learn to, to, to be like, I guess a decent term would be, uh, learn to be a cog in that, learn to be like the, the, the tax cattle that the government needs them to be. Um, and, like I think a lot of the reason people become anarchists, uh, and that the reason that anarchy is largely a, a leftist ideology, I guess would mm -hmm. be a good sure. word for it, would it's be that a lot of at least, yeah. Well, is is that a lot of these people just wanted out, and they didn't really like have a whole lot of, uh, especially historically before there were like video and audio recordings that were available to the common person. Um, like a lot of these people wouldn't have even had the means to adequately convey it. It, w it would have been all philosophy, like sort of uh, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson or um, fucking mm -hmm. uh, what was his name um, Thoreau. Um, right. So I, I, I like it, now that there is this easy access to to a media platform. I think like having as many people start doing this to where it's less. 
oh, that's interesting and more, huh, you know, that, that actually might work. Uh, I think that that's very important. And I think that that's something that a lot of the more introverted people uh, don't, don't get or don't want to get because essentially they're, they're operating on the, the old school sort of like, you know, nobody's ever going to listen to me kind of thing. Uh, when essentially they could they could get out there, they could put their message out there and at least reach somebody so that the information could spread by zeitgeist. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. But just to speak to one other, I guess, prob one other type of individual who may not, uh, you know, produce self-liberational media. Um, there are there there is one person that reached out to me on the Vani podcast page, and he's been a Vay nomad for like twenty five or thirty years, and they have a sailboat that they live in part time. Like this guy um, is a true Vanuan, but he never he just didn't know of the of the term. So he he's, he splits time in his van and his sailboat, which is really really badass. But um, <clears throat> he um is he's he's, he's not he, I wouldn't say he's introverted, but he's he just practices very very rigid security culture, and he has for a long time. Um, so, I mean, he, he communicated with, he communicated with me on, on fascist book and, uh, you know, told me about uh, his lifestyle and all of that, but, uh, he didn't want to make the step to, you know, uh, um, doing a YouTube video or doing a podcast, um, just because, uh, he, he stays under the radar. Um, so that's right. another possibility too, is that they just practice really, really good security culture and maybe they have kids with them. Maybe they, maybe they have kids or, or someone traveling with them and, and, you know, they're, they're just, you know, they want to make sure that, uh, you know, they're, their uh, their 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 family is uh, as safe as possible. So that's that's another possibility too, because the state the state is a really evil uh, evil institution, and, and they don't like homeless people. Um, I'm sure you've seen uh, a lot of the way uh, oh, yeah. you know homeless people have been treated by the state. Criminal you know uh, whether it's spikes on uh, spikes on benches or you know what whatever it is. Um, when you're living in a van, um, uh, you could get harassed a little extra just for the sake of you being homeless. So one of the recommendations just for this, just for the benefit of your listeners, if you live in your van, um, just, just, you know, you, I'm not going to recommend you lie to the police, but just say you're, don't lie, just leave out some truth and say, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm on a, uh, I'm on a road trip. Um, I'm traveling. Um, because that's not, right. yeah, that's, yeah. Just, if, if you let them know you're, you're, you're homeless, uh, even if it's by choice. Yeah. They don't like that. They, they do not like that. Right. And uh, cause like, one of the movies that I that I like and one of the movies that like I really recommend people look at to see sort of like the, the fictional version of the alternate perspective to this sort of like, oh, life in this culture and uh, in servile bullshit is normal uh, is Captain Fantastic. Have you seen that? I have not. No. Well, it's a really good movie about a guy who who has uh, I think if I remember correctly, it was five kids. And he, like, he tries to reintegrate with society without losing his his sense. And he has, uh, he has these kids on this rigid sort of like um, phil philosophical and 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 wild and basically a uh, Vanu kind of uh, mentality. Um, and it's it's all designed to to teach them. Um, how to live without society and like the entire rest of society hates him for that his kids have bruises because they were climbing rocks um and 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 fucking fell and ba bashed on a rock or something they have they have like cuts and scrapes because life in the wild is 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 well wild it's not as not and, as comfortable right yeah Right, and and the rest of society doesn't really understand that, and they constantly attack him for it. And he's got some flaws. It's not like being a person in the wild makes you perfect, and it makes you some sort of ideological saint. But he's he doesn't have as many flaws as people want to claim he does, and uh, and so the the entire movie is a very interesting transition into him, um, like finding out that society isn't all that bad um but his kids still like sticking around with him and uh in, in the end anyway and uh and like it's a very good movie to sort of see the clash of those two worlds i wouldn't necessarily call it like anything remotely approaching a documentary um you know it's it's fiction and it's not necessarily that i want people to base their lives on something that didn't happen but maybe you know more of that culture could start coming up 
if people started to take this sort of approach more often. And that would be interesting to me because this entire war is a culture war. It's all in people's minds. So, um, but you, you were talking about something in the Facebook chat um, and you were, you were talking about this thing, second realm. Uh, mind, mind talking a little bit about that in our, uh, in our final minutes here. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, so um, for, for, purposes here i mean it's just, we're talking about difference in, in in time here we're talking about 1960s versus uh, like the 2000s um so uh, so second realm um so second realm and vani mini culture are synonymous terms and first realm and the state of survival society are synonymous terms here so um so uh, a quick def I'll, I'll provide a quick definition and i'll just kind of flesh this out real briefly um so the first realm as uh, a society that does not respect self-ownership or individual liberty but rather heralds the supremacy of government and authority in other words, it upholds a collective as superior to the individual. So the first realm is the the status of all society. You know what anarchists despise. You know the state, um, the authoritarians who empower the state, um, and the culture that uh, you know does not uh, respect uh, individualism and self ownership. So that's that's the first realm, um, and the second realm is. Um, is technically described as encrypted communication, encrypted currencies, anonymous and pseudonymous identities, and untraceable action. Um, so the idea is uh, the second realm are free autonomous zones where people can actually be free, where their autonomy is respected, where there's peace, and where people are actually truly free. Um, now, <clears throat> um, they can, I guess one other point on that, uh, they can, uh, second realms can exist in both uh, physical and digital, uh, in the physical and digital realm. So uh, like, the, like deep web IRC chats, um, deep web marketplaces, those would be uh, examples of digital second realms. Um, now, physical second realms, uh, some examples of that would be freedom festivals like the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest coming up next month, uh, like uh, Jackalope, uh, the Jackalope Freedom Festival that happens in, I think, Arizona or New Mexico. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, those would be examples of uh, physical second realms. Uh, Van Nomad intentional communities would be examples of second realms. They're free autonomous places where people where, the, you know, state inf state interference is, you know, not there where people can actually live free. Um, so that's the basic idea of the first and the second realm. Um, let me see if there's anything else interesting. We, we, we just wrapped up a, an entire series on it on Liberty Under Attack Radio, 16 episodes. It came out to like uh, 40 hours, I think it was. Um, so I'm not going to go too, too much in depth there because that, that's, uh, that entire series is there. But the idea is to build free autonomous zones in reality where people can actually be free. Um, and, uh, you know, Vani, the Vani lifestyle changes overlap with this very nicely. All of the work I do really, really, really coalesces. So um, when you talk about Vani shelters, whether it's uh, a, a, a polyethylene tent in the Siskiyou National Forest, that would be an example of a second realm. If we're talking about a, uh, a seastead out in the middle of the ocean, that would be a second realm. Uh, if we're talking about <clears throat> the intentional community that Derek Bros is going to start up in uh, 2020 down in Texas, that would be an example of a second realm. Um, I mean, there are a lot of examples of these uh, these out there now, but I th but the, the 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 reason I'm talking about it so much now is that um, I'd like to see a, a lot of people only really live free for a couple of weekends out of the year at freedom festivals or whatever. There's there are fewer there are some folks out there who you know live free a lot more often if they're van nomads or minimal sailboaters or whatever, but uh, the idea is to um, you know live free more often you know more more of the time. Um, so to, to create a bunch of these second realms where people can actually live free is, is the idea. So as for people who, who want like actual freedom as, as a paradigm rather than just something to get their energy out while, you know, once, once every once in a while. Yeah. Oh, yes. And let me add this, this one other thing here. So I'm sure you've heard the quote, I think it was by Winston Churchill, you know, build a new society within the shell of the old. Um, well, with the second realm, what we're doing um, is we're building the new society, not within the shell of the old, but outside of it and despite its coercive existence. So we're basically, uh, you know, building our own free autonomous zones, regardless of what's happening in the second or happening in the first realm. Uh, we don't care what's what's going on there. We're going to live free in the here and now. Uh, in our second realms, uh, and we're not going to try to change the system. We're not going to try to uh, vote or f vote for the right people in. We're not going to use assassination politics to, uh, you know, murder their rulers. We're not going to do that. We're not going to try to influence or change the first realm at all. We're going to go live free in the here and now um, with people who respect, you know, uh, per person and autonomy. So that's that's the idea. All right, and, and so on that level, the second realm would be for people who are basically you know, itching to inch themselves. Inching to inch themselves. 
Oh, um, um, in, inches. I'm never coming home. Uh, you you have an inch bag where you where you have all the basic essentials, and uh, and you could just go out into the wilderness at any point with that bag. So basically, people who are who 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 want to n- not be a part of the mainstream culture, those would be the people who would do a second realm society, uh, pr- proverbially speaking. <laughs> Well, the the second realm, and, and I, I guess I should have mentioned this. It's not. Uh, we're we're not talking about you know wilderness Vanu anymore. These are crypto anarchists. These are people who, right. um, you know, build did, who who built a digital currency in 2013 because they realized that Bitcoin wasn't anonymous. These are folks who you know operate deep web IRC chats and marketplaces. Like these guys are are crypto anarchists. So um, so um, there's a really good and and this the, this this would best illustrate I think there's a really good uh no uh I guess crypto agorist uh, novella called hashtag agora, and <clears throat> So these second realms, I mean, they were in Berlin, Germany. Um, so like they were, they were essentially, you know, living free in a city using various strategies, strategies and tactics that they've uh, that they that they've developed. Um, so as far as not interacting with uh, the uh, for the first realm or the survival society at all, not necessarily. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be a complete withdrawal. Um, some people may choose to. Uh, you you could have uh, two different. Uh, per, you could have two different uh, identities. You could have your identity in the first in the first realm where you have your normal nine to five job. You um, pay some taxes, and then uh, you know uh, at a very whenever whenever you decide to, you can enter second realms. You know for the other fifty percent of the time, and uh, you can live free. Whether that's attending a bunch of freedom festivals, whether that's a whether that is uh, you know working uh, you know a nine to five job for six months out of the year and living in a van the rest of it, um, whatever, whatever it ends up being, um, the 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 idea is to um, live more of your live more of your life free. Um, than what you were before. So it doesn't require a complete withdrawal. I mean, it's it's definitely shades of gray. There's some folks who only attend one Freedom Festival a year, and that will be the only Second Realm experience they have. There'll be others who will have, uh, you know, like 95% of their time living in Second Realms, and that's great too. So it's in no in no way, shape, or form a complete withdrawal from the uh, from the First Realm. But the important point is that the First Realm and the Second Realm are clearly distinguished and delineated. And um, obviously, uh, the first realm, if they they don't like the existence of second realms of free places, um, they, as I said earlier, they most they, they'd like to see most of us tossed in a cage for just holding the ideas that we do. Um, so <clears throat> these are two very distinct realms, and um, and uh, yeah, the second realm is basically where, where people can can actually live free. So, so so the second realm is more like um, a parallel society, like they won't yes, necessarily touch. Okay, so. So, so it's people in the same area, but on different tracks, essentially. Sure, yeah, because you could have you could have a second realm, uh, um, you know, located in um, the area of a first realm, but it's uh, it's it's just uh, you know distinguished in that in that second realm, people can live free. Uh, you know, there's respect for personal autonomy, even though it may be embedded within an alien society. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So, generally speaking, because we do have to wrap this up. Sure. What would your message be to people to try and get them to disconnect from from society the way society wants things to be? Right, right, and and this is the 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 two piece. I guess the one piece of advice I give in pretty much every single podcast or interview I do, and it's uh, even if you don't know what you're, even if you don't know what you want to do, or even if any of the things I presented today um, aren't appealing to you, there's one thing I would recommend um, everyone you know start doing now if you haven't already. And that's uh, one, uh, you know, uh, um, make your, you know, make your job location independent. Um, that's that's a big one. Um, that alone will, uh, you know, even even for people, you know, in the state of all society, um, being on your being your own boss and being on your own schedule, um, that's extremely freeing. Rather than being, you know, uh, you know, run through the uh, the the, uh, the the corporate machine. So, um, you know, make your job location independent and or pursue financial independence where a jobs be- where a job becomes optional. Um, so those would be the the two things I would I would definitely advise because e- e- even if you aren't sure, I mean, it took me three years before I decided I was going to be a van nomad after learning about the freedom strategy. So even if you're completely unsure, maybe it's not the right time in your life yet. Maybe you've got to pay off some debt. Maybe you have to, um, I don't know, get your kid through high school. I don't know, whatever the situation may be. We're all individuals. Um, <clears throat> The idea is to start taking a con- like a concrete step now that um, you know doesn't require a major lifestyle change at all. Um, just making your making your job location independent, or you know, uh, intensively saving and living frugally, um, so that you can retire early. You know, age forty instead of uh, age sixty five, like it is in the survival society, or sixty two, or whatever it is. Um, so that would be the the main piece of advice. And the second would be. 
I just I want to reemphasize re that you know this this life is this life is short, and we only have one of them to live. You know, barring any religious discussions, um, or religious debates, um, we only have one life to live. And I know for for me personally, I want to live free. Um, I want to live free, and I I, I every single day I spend in the survival society is it's it's a day. It's a, it's it just motivates me more to you know get on the road and, and pursue van nomadism van nomadism so I can actually be free. Um, so that's that's kind of I, I I would just you know really implore your listeners to, you know really, really sit down and think about what it is that they want out of life. And, and if, if freedom is one of those things, um, then I would, I would, I would advise that, you know, a really, you know, deep thought and look into the various strategies, strategies available, um, would, would definitely be a, a, a wise, a wise idea. So, um, there's the building the second realm series over at Liberty under attack. Uh, you can get, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot more information than what I, what I just, uh, you know, laid out there. Uh, you can also check out the Vani podcast where, I mean, we, all we talk about is Vanu and, and, and freedom strategies. The first, the first season was philosophy because the philosophy behind Vanu is pretty unique. But um, we're only talking about action and solutions. So if if you want to be free in the here and now, um, then uh, you know that's those are two great re great sources of uh, of self liberational media. So very cool. All right. Well, thank you for coming on. It was uh, it was very informative. Um, and so you would recommend that people just find you at the at the Vanu Podcast uh, website. Yep, uh, vanupodcast.com. dot com. And uh, if any of your listeners have any uh, questions or anything like that, Shane at vanupodcast dot com uh, is uh, is the email. Cool. All right. Well, this has been the latest episode of State Smash Podcast. Uh, make sure to subscribe and uh, and like if you liked this presentation, um, and make sure to uh, spread this so sort of video around because realistically, that's the way that this sort of thing is going to get off the ground. We got to start talking to each other. Um, communication is the first fruits of change, and being able to tell your family maybe to uh, to 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 move out and be their own person, being able to actively convey this message to people that's good that, that 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 has the potential to change the world so um thank you for coming on shane there's going to be a post show afterward and uh this has been state smash podcast signing out